The world of War Machine is one defined by living gods, city-sized dragons, warring nations and those who dare to stand against them. This is a gritty, war-ravaged life for your average infantrymen, arcane elves, stout dwarves and hardy trolls, but among these rank and file heroes stand towering warjacks, hulking war beasts, and those with an iron will so strong they can dominate and control these machines of war with their arcane connection. These war machines of military might that dictate how war needs to be fought somehow aren't the biggest threat. Fate ebbs and flows and twists around the war casters and warlocks of the world who use their powers to grant boons to their allies, curse their enemies and power their own heroic feats to superhuman levels. Left unopposed, these warcasters with their warjack battle groups will dominate the battlefield and single-handedly change the borders of nations. The only ones strong enough to help humanity hold on to the mortal plane against the tyranny of dragons and the corrupted abominations their blood brings forth when these heroes among men meet on opposite sides of the battlefield. <sighs> Let's just say there's no atheists in a foxhole when warcasters are the artillery and gods are real. So, you've decided that you are interested in War Machine and you want to learn about the world of Imoran, 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 and the Iron Kingdoms. Good news, in this video I am going to give you an overview of the wonderful world of War Machine and by the end of this video you'll know the general history and mythology of the Iron Kingdoms. Some recent history about some of the great heroes up to and including the invasion of Infernals and then know how each faction evolved into their existing Mark IV tabletop persona, where I give you rundowns of each faction and warcaster in the game at the point of recording. If you want to see a general primer of War Machine in 2024, a buyer's guide and a beginner's guide, and yes, I promise those are all very different things I just said there, despite the names, those are all on this channel. And if you want to see a battle report, check out my other channel, tactical skew um, where I may or may not have done a battle report based on my motivation at the time. With that said, we're here now for a lore breakdown. I will very quickly cover the deep history, give a general overview of the last 20 years and then focus in on the newest lore, the narratives and stories and factions you'll actually see being put on the table and interacted with right now in the latest edition of Mark IV. As of course, War Machine is an evolving narrative that constantly moves forwards, unlike some other narratives that deliberately point out how stale they are as a point of pride. That, that would be weird to do, wouldn't it? Okay, first things first, where to find all of the history and novels and fiction in War Machine? We've got four sources, source books, novels, magazines and the app. Source books are all the lore in the rule books, starting from the original RPG in, I think it was 2001, all the way through all of the games up to the currently releasing D&D 5th edition compatible Iron Kingdoms Requiem source book, which if you're interested in knowing more is actually a brilliant primer for everything pre-Mark IV. Privateer produced a magazine called No Quarter. This is the same as the source books, <clears throat> individual stories that kind of flesh out the world and its history and little bits and bits and bobs scattered in the rules themselves. Then we have novels. Privateer used to have its own publishing arm called Skull Island Expeditions. And this posted a like a whole load of individual novels printed, posted a whole load of individual novels and stories that typically took place in the modern timeline when they were published. We then had a brief time where they were playing with mini, fa mini fiction on Twitter in which the Infernal Wars were coming to a head. And they released all relevant information on Twitter. Lol, lamau, Twitter. But luckily uh, that's all being collated into a big forum post to read as one thing. Then finally now we have the app. Every Mark IV faction and army and every new warcaster is getting their own lore as they're released. And we are getting novellas released in the app that are taking us through the beginnings of the world as the Orgoth begin their invasion. The effects that's having, including how it's causing new factions to rise up. Before we kick off, uh, I want to pitch to you why I personally enjoy the War Machine world. Basically, it's a great mixture of traditional fantasy, but with protagonists and a world brought up to the pre-digital era. 
So from a technological perspective, we can have a dragon and a wizard and a dude with a gun and a dude in full plate armor all stood next to each other. But they could be talking and acting like a modern human. Not modern as in today, not that level of modern, right? But modern like from the 1950s, which is close enough. It's a world building reason to have people talking like regular people and having modern concerns and sensibilities without needing to have a huge aura of suspension of disbelief around the characters themselves. Okay, super brief overview of everything and the old stuff that brings us up to the year 603 in the War Machine world, where the game launched and models became playable. The prehistory, if you will. None of this will ever be relevant on the tabletop, to clarify, but it's general mythology that makes up the core of the world and the religions, etc. If you want deeper dives into War Machine lore, check out, at least the ones I know of, Professor Caster, Max Acorn and Servant of Nero. Otherwise, as with any primer of a whole fantasy world, even when just glossing over it super quickly, there is a lot to cover. So if you don't care about the general mythology and things before like the latest edition of the game, check the timestamps below to jump to the era you're interested in. Before we dive into the deep lore, we're almost there, sorry, do consider liking, subscribing and leaving a comment. And if you really like what I'm doing here, check me out on Patreon where you can spam me with messages telling me to make more War Machine content because that's just about the only way I will. Entrapment, blackmail, I don't know. But either I'm doing it to you or you're doing it to me. So that's very wholesome. You know, it's very wholesome. Uh, you know, for your comment, tell me your favourite War Machine faction and why. Or, if you don't know War Machine at all, which faction just looks the coolest behind me. And for my colourblind viewers who are wondering why is this guy wearing a brown hoodie over a brown shirt. Hashtag same. Okay. General mythological overview. This is a world called Cain, where gods are real and within the lifespans of some of the elves of the world, they have walked among the mortals. With gods being real, it's also known that the afterlife, called Urcane, is real. Between Cain and Urcane, there is the void, where lost souls linger. Gods are, of course, your top tier power level. Just below them are the great dragons of the world, the greatest and first of all being Torok. Within each dragon is their heart. A dragon heart is called an Athank. Athank? Athank. Athank. A thonk? Athank. And this can be split and form new lesser dragons or just generally imbue some of their power and essence into others. Dragons range in size and can be city-sized impossible monstrosities all the way down to only the size of a small skyscraper. Mortals can take or be gifted these Athanks, which will increase their own power. More on these later, obviously. The dragons are living on the world of Cain and at times will interact with the mortals, always to disastrous consequences for the mortals. Okay? Dragons are smart with full mental faculties. These are no wild beasts. All right? They can talk. Ish. Imran is the continent that War Machine takes place on. We know of another continent called Zu, Z-U, where trade has been established, and we know that one of the races, the Orgoth, are from another continent, not Zu. Within the continent of Imran, we have the Iron Kingdoms, which are the kingdoms that signed the Corvus Treaties after they reformed their own nations after rebelling against the Orgoth oppressors. Officially, these are Signar, Cador, Lael, and Ord. You also have dwarves to the north and elves to the east. Yes, that's right who are welcomed among the Iron Kingdoms, but technically not part of them. This is also, uh, th yeah, there's also like the Nightmare Kingdom of Crix to the south, who are very much not welcomed among the Normies. But damn, they're cool AF, as foretold. Okay, so, quick recap, quick recap, okay. Gods are at the top, but are now all gone. Dragons are still here, and their hearts provide enough power to win wars, so are highly sought after, but under normal circumstances are too powerful for mortals to harm. The world is called Cain. The continent is called Imran. The majority of the good guys and any role playing happens in the Iron Kingdoms. Back to the gods. Okay. <clears throat> Let's do it. The gods of men are Menoth, Moro, Thamar and Cyrus. Elves have their own pantheon and dwarves have their own pantheon. Then there are the primordial gods of the Devourer Worm, 
Dunia and Grimkin. Right. Menoth is your standard good guy. One true god that everyone is expected to worship whatever level you want to worship at. Signar, as our flagship good guy kingdom, worship Menoth. If someone isn't religious, they still say they worship Menoth, right? Like I said, modern sensibilities. But you then have the humans that live in Caspia, right next to Signar, called the Protectorate of Menoth, and they are the religious fanatics who are pretty mental about the whole religion thing, so devotion is very much a sliding scale in the world of Cain. Menoth is called the Lawgiver and created humans and is most often depicted as a masked giant towering over his frightened worshippers. You then get the twin sister gods, Moro and Thamar. Wait, one of them's a guy. They're not twin sisters. The twins, maybe? Who were born humans but ascended to godhood. To cut a long story short, Thamar is a bad god. Moro is a neutral god. And it's not that worshipping Thamar makes you inherently bad, but Thamar tends to be the god that Kador worship, and they're the bad guys in the overall narrative, so they go hand in hand. Also, kind of like their prime thing is like selfishness, whatever. If you worship Thamar and Signar, it's probably best to keep quiet about it, even though it's not technically illegal, but you almost certainly will be, like, will be looked upon or outcast for it. Moro is seen kind of as a weird quirk within Signar. It's an oddity, but hey, fine, whatever, it's a neutral god. Quick note here, no mortals of Imran naturally have magic. It all has to come from a higher power, whether that be gods, dragons, or infernals. More on them in a moment. Humans gained magic when Moro and Thamar ascended to godhood, and on the way, they agreed with the Nanocrian infernals that humanity could have magic in exchange for giving up the location of the elven pantheon and a third of all human souls later down the line. More on that later. And as we're talking about magic in relation to the mortals, if you have magic, you're called gifted. And this can range in power from being a sixth sense about vague things up to, in theory, anything. There's technically no limit. And yeah. Mm. However, what makes someone a warcaster instead of just a gun mage or a sorcerer or some such is that they can use their magic to engage the archantric cortexes of warjacks. In theory, a war <clears throat> In theory, a warcaster could be less powerful than a regular gun mage, but technically a warcaster nonetheless. On to the dragons. The biggest baddest of all dragons is the dragon father Torok. Torok is worshipped by the Nightmare Kingdom of Crix. They serve Torok pretty unwaveringly, um, well, blah, 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 unwaveringly, because unlike the good kingdoms, if you mess up in Crix, you will die. No time for judge, jury, and executioner when you've got a god dragon looking over you. Torok is, from what we can tell, the one and only progenitor of his kind. He is akin to a god. At some point, whilst hanging around on Cain, he decided to split his Athank to create the lesser dragons. None of these new dragons could match him in any aspect of his self, and they were super jelly of his power, and so he didn't much care for them and decided to reabsorb them to restore himself to full power. Although he wins against each of them individually with ease, when it's like 9 against 1 or whatever the number is, we don't know how many dragons actually exist, he struggles to land a killing blow. As such, all of his little friends run and hide a lot, to be honest. This leads us to our first documented event of note in War Machine, of the Dragon Wars, taking place between 1800 to 1000 BR, before Rebellion. Important parts are the Dragon Everblight was hiding way up to the north of Imran, slowly tainting the Ogren up there. Around the same time, the Elvish god Syra, Skyra? I'm gonna say Syra, but it could be either one there because it's a C. Oh, it was probably Celtic, so it's Kyra. Skyra, Syra, returned to Earth and then died. And then the dragon Blightergast rallied the surviving dragons to attack Torok, and they drive Torok off of the mainland, and he takes shelter down to the Shard Islands, the nightmare kingdom of Crix. Both Blightergast and Torok are left needing potentially centuries to recover their wounds from this battle. Additional note, Torok is the first dragon and created all of the dragons we ever here talked about in his quest to regain his power from them. But it's confirmed that other dragons do exist after Torok, not from Torok. Although nothing is known about them, to be honest. Right, cool. Over the next 1000 years, a few things happen. The Orgoth invade at 600 BR. 140 BR, 
the riveting occurs. This is where the elven gods die and the elves lose their magic, but magic is given to the rest of the mortal races and we start to see warcasters and warlocks appearing in humans and other races. At the same time, humans create colossals and weaponized gunpowder. We then reach 1AR, which is where the rebellion is begun, because it's AR is after rebellion, BR before, AR after, right? That's where the rebellion is begun against the Orgoth by the Iron, Iron Fellowship, okay? Therefore, we can assume that BR and AR mean before rebellion and after rebellion. Cool, 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 cool. It's also specifically stated that's what they mean, not just assumed. In 201 AR, the last Orgoth leave Imran, and then 202 AR, the Corvus Treaty is signed, which ratifies the modern Iron Kingdoms as we know them today. Okay, cool. <clears throat> now we can start looking at the history of the Iron Kingdoms from the year 546 AR up until 623 AR. Because the year 622 AR is where Mark IV begins. So everything between the start of the tabletop game until Mark IV. Now, obviously, there are 14 factions who all have their own nooks and crannies, so I can't cover them all. I'm giving you an overview to get you up to speed. During this period, we have multiple novels covering multiple factions and characters. There is a heavy focus on the war between Signar and Kador as the prime event, right? The instigation of it all. This is done, in my view, because these are two very realistic factions. The Cricks, despite clearly being the most evil and dangerous faction, are undead monstrosities. A great boogeyman, but if that's your enemy, you're going to have a very, very binary story, right? Likewise, the Protectorate of Menoth are religious fanatics who literally crucify their captured prisoners and bring them back onto the battlefield to scare the enemy. There's not much wiggle room in that story, right? And whilst Kador are, are, are always, always portrayed, uh, as comically evil in novels and clearly in the wrong, it could be argued that it's an unreliable narrator from Signal's perspective because the few times we see Kador as the viewpoint, although yes, they have a different culture of morality, honor, duty, etc., they are still ultimately normal humans and are relatable in certain ways. 546 AR Serfdom is abolished in Kador, meaning that Kadorans must now all work equally for what they have and can't be carried by their local prince or, in theory, be slaves to their local prince. In Signar, King Vinter Railthorn IV comes to power and kills off his political rivals and creates the Inquisition. Always a good thing, obviously. Nothing wrong with that. The elvish nation of Ios cuts itself off from all outsiders in the same year. Commander Adept Sebastian Nemo invents the Stormglaive, bringing the power of lightning to the elite soldiers of Signar, who are all noble-born knights and lords in the Stormguard. A lot happened in this year, I understand. Let's just go with it. This is one of those interesting quirks of War Machine that I like and that leans it more towards steampunk than trad fantasy. Traditional fantasy, I don't know why I wrote trad there. The outcome is the same, people wielding lightning, right? But in War Machine, the way they give this to the common soldier is through technology. Their Stormglaives have internal gyro, gyro stabilizers alongside Arcane Mechanica to help with the weight of the weapon and require precision engineering to function. There's a clear focus on the technology, whereas in another world it tends to just be, oh yeah, we put some magic crystals in the sword hilt. It's purely thematic preference, but it's something that sets War Machine apart from most others. Anyway, right, sorcery gets outlawed by Railthorn. Then the shard invasions begin between Crix and Signar. A lot of women get killed for witchcraft, and a smattering of men, but mainly women. <clears throat> so 20 years after Railthorn takes the throne, he is overthrown by his son, Leto Railthorn, in the Lion's Coup. Leto takes up the crown of Signar. Vinter isn't killed, just runs away and comes back later and invades somewhere, but it's not hugely relevant. Cool. In 605 AR, we start getting a lot of things happening because this is really where the actual tabletop game starts to be played. So the fiction is filling in events that are time relevant at this point. Cool. More brown shirt being opened up for you. This, this shirt does look brown to me. Just to, I'm just throwing it out there. All right. Signar and the Protectorate go to all-out war as the Protectorate tries to go on a crusade. Okay. Crixian raiders strike deep into the heart of Signar, poisoning crops and grain silos. In 607 AR, Signar beat the Protectorate at Crusade after very almost having their own capital taken. You can read more about that in the novel Into the Storm. I'd recommend it, pretty good novel. 
608 AR is a pretty chill year with every faction consolidating its forces and agreeing to ceasefires. Very wholesome. 609 AR sees Signar and Kador briefly join forces to push out Crix from the Thornwood before Kador betrays the temporary alliance and attacks Signar. Pretty standard. Standard Kador. Same year, Torok returns and has a big old dragon fight in the skies over the Wormwall. Those are mountains, by the way. Then in 612 AR, we have the invasion of the Infernals. Decades of subterfuge by hidden Infernal cultists come to fruition and the Infernals, being from the Void, as discussed before, manage to attack every large city all at the same time. The Infernals are extra-dimensional demons which humanity made a pact with to grant them magic to help them beat the Orgoth. Covered, nice. Somehow related to the Rivening, uh, but like not 100%, but like, yeah, it is. And now the Infernals have come to collect their debt. Minor note, these are specifically a sect of Infernals called the Nanocrion. The entire continent of Im Imoran, yes, Imoran, is left shell-shocked by this attack. And we have lots of major figures in the lore and on the tabletop up to this point being killed. Mm, sad. Ultimately though, the mortals of Cain beat off the Infernals. No, there was no other way I could have phrased that. Anytime you have the opportunity to say somebody beat somebody else off, you have, you must take it, right, you know. Why, the, literally the whole point of this video is so that I could have said that. Right, anyway, that's the history of Mark 1 to the end of Mark 3. Between Mark 3 and Mark 4, we have the latest Iron Kingdom's RPG take place, Requiem. So if you want lots of detail about the missing decade, you can buy those source books. They're pretty great. Things happen, kingdoms change, and attempt to recover. But Imran is fundamentally altered with many factions legitimately wiped out. Legion of Everblight and Protectorate of Menoth are two prime examples. No longer exist, all gone, very unalived, except not entirely. Because you've got to leave things open so you can release models, right? Which brings us to 10 years after the end of the Infernal Wars, when the Orgoth invade in the year 622 AR, and that kicks off Mark IV. So, who are the Mark IV factions? What is the modern law landscape of War Machine? As this is the modern times and therefore the most important for us to know, especially when starting out, so that we can get to grips with which faction we might be most interested in starting, because it's current, there's also the least amount of it, right? Because it's happening at right now. There's, yeah. We don't have decades of old lore to pour over, we have what's in the app. If you want to find out more than I will cover, check the app, it has it there. Some of the factions have a Forces of War Machine, entry which gives you a very quick and concise summary of everything that faction is about and what the faction has been doing in the last decade up to like just as the Orgoth invade. Then each warcaster has their own story in the app which nicely fleshes them out. And then if you want the in-depth guide every army has a compendium entry which if you're into the lore is really where to start. Also we have the five novellas currently re released in the app which are also you know all there and good. Right. The Orgoth returned to Imran 800 years after being kicked out. They hit hard and fast just like you like it, out of nowhere, not how you like it. Currently, we have six factions back in play. Signar, Kador, Orgoth, the Eternal Dusk, Southern Creels, and Chimera. We have also just seen Crix be announced as the next faction to return, okay? Signar are the protagonist faction for the setting. In the world of the Iron Kingdoms, they have the most military might to throw around, the most natural resources, hence the most military might. Not because they have the most numbers or the most raw brute force, but because they are the most balanced, the most technologically advanced, and generally have leaders that care about their soldiers' lives the most. If you want a good guy faction, this is the one. They have plenty of in, in like internal strife, as different chancellors vie for power and backstab and court politics. And of course, when you get down to street level, there's never a back that can't be stabbed. But Signar are the imperialistic might of the world. Cool. To cut a long story short, they are basically fantasy England. Oh, and actually, on a total random aside, if Signar is fantasy England, you know who that makes America? Protectorate of Menoth. Literally not even joking. Like, that, that's, you know, like, yeah, like the, the events track. They're mirrored there. Just saying. Signar's high level of technology comes in the form of Storm Chambers. Wait, Storm Chambers, isn't that the Age of Sigmar? I don't know, Storm Generating Arcantric Tech. 
They are the first faction to technologically advance beyond steam, able to power their warjacks with arcane lightning instead of shoveled coal. And they use these inventions not just to bling out their warjacks, but also to get that tech into the hands of their infantry, making their infantry some of the most casually powerful on the battlefield. But in true gritty warfare style, the other side of Signal's military are the Grave Diggers, named so because of their high casualty count and like as they go for trench warfare, it's like they're digging their own... <clears throat> yeah, you get it. The Trencher Corps are classic World War I fight fantasy themed fighters. They hold the line and fight in the dirt. While those elite storm legions are forming the cutting edge of the Signarum blade, these mad lads are the hilt. They've got guns, artillery, fortifications. It's literally World War I fantasy. I can't say much more. Then you've got the third arm of the Signaran military, which is the CRS, Signaran Reconnaissance Service. The Arcane Tempest, if you will. This is filled with gun mages, the elite of the elite who don't bother with all that heavy armor nonsense because every single member here is a magic user, able to infuse their bullets with magic to give it the effect it needs, whether that be a spectral round that can pass through walls, a push to turn a pistol into the lethality range of a sniper rifle, or some other arcane secret they may know. They tend to be the secret missions behind enemy lines type, with only like the occasional frontline unit to support the trenches. During the decade of peace and consolidation, Signar as the protagonist faction did exactly that. King Julius died and his heirs are too young, and so instead Signar gains Leto's wife, Queen Regent Marjorie. She's holding the throne until her son, Prince Waldred, that, that's a name, right? Waldred is of age. She has been in power for a mere five days by the time she gets word via Telegram, as yes, Telegram exists in War Machine's technology level, of course, as do trains, that Orgoth are invading. King Leto, who had abdicated the throne for his son Julius, remains stepped down and has joined a council of advisors for the new queen. Hasn't been mentioned in this recap, but he shows up a lot in a lot of the stories, and that is Scout General Bolden Rebold. Rebold? Rebold? I don't know. He's head of the Signarum Reconnaissance Service, is the spy master and information gatherer broker of Signar. I note him here just because with so many main characters dying, it's of note that the spy master is still the same old guy. Probably because he doesn't have a model and they don't need to sell a new one. No salt here. The current army of Signar is the Storm Legion. The previous Storm Knights were disbanded. You see, the Storm Knights were the realm of knights only, whereas the commoners had to join the trenches or long rifles. With the Orgoth threat, Signar knew it needed to get its defining trait into the hands of more people. There was a big push for the new Storm Legion to be merit-based instead of rank, title and land holdings based. Now, these are still the absolute elite of the elite of Signar's forces, venerated as heroes when they are the, like, when they are the cavalry that come charging in to save the trenches day, make no mistake. Except now, they're basically the definition of competency porn with no weak links in the chain. We also have the Stormforge cadre for Signar. Being a cadre and therefore usable with any Signar army, you'd think there'd be tons of information because the cadres are kind of must-buys for those who are super into a faction. And there is in the app, but as they're not a core army, and I'd like the video to be under three hours, I have to cut things off somewhere, so no cadre discussion here, soz. Long story short, Lightning is cool AF, and they give galvanic and mechanical technology that can go like into all Signar armies. There you go, that's the Stormforge. We have three war, war bleh, bleh. we have three war casters for the Storm Legion. Captain Athena de Barrow, Major Anson Wolf, and Captain Madison Calder. Okay. Captain Athena de Barrow is the third child of an Ordish merchant and only daughter. Always ignored by her father. Oh, daddy issues. Ah, oh, guys, why did you do that? Whatever. The day she found her affinity for Warjacks was the happiest day of her life until she realised that her father's excitement was only because handing over his younger child to the Signaran Strategic Academy would cement his company as loyalist approved and so increase his profits. She spent most of her learning career trying to fail to thwart her father's selfishness. Alas, like literally all Warcasters we're going to cover today, by the way, she was exceptionally gifted in both martial and arcane skills. 
It was during this education that she was taught by Major Anson Wolfe, and it was in fact Wolfe that showed her her true path. Her first taste of combat, a routine smuggler check in the docks, and her first kill rid her of her childish ways, and she saw the light. She was born to kill. She enjoyed it. But you know, like in a, in a normal, good, healthy way, not in a bad, evil, evil way, right? Upon leaving the academy and beginning her journeyman tour, she was under the guidance of Beth Maddox. She was, of course, the best warcaster ever, but was happy to leave Maddox to come back and form part of the new Storm Legion alongside her friend, Wolf. But who is Major Anson Wolf? Already a veteran enough warcaster to be teaching in the academy when Athena was just coming up through it, he is no stranger to war and through his years has suffered innumerable scars both physical and emotional. His father was a blacksmith for the Roomwood estate and instilled the teachings of Morrow to Anson like a strong work ethic and a sense of duty, very neutral down the line, a fence sitter if you will. Also a despising of nobles, Natch. Well, Anson didn't like his father's notion of never trying to rise above your station and so looked up, looked up to Elaine Runewood. If history were to look back on the closeness of their time together, I'm sure it would say they were good friends. Long story short, Anson found out he was a warcaster by accident, much as Athena had. Anson grew into the life the Runewoods could give him, fell in love with a noble woman he could never have, revealed he wasn't a noble, she tried to get him arrested, and Anson joined the military to escape such things, as you do. He joined the Trencher Corps, of course. The Trencher Corps is basically... Infantry, sir. Good for you. Mobile infantry made me the man I am today. A few years of slogging through the mud and fighting the Protectorate, and he finds himself drinking away his troubles when he is reunited with Elaine. Alan? Oh, Alan, my boy. Now an officer in the Signar military. Rising above his station once again led to trouble, and he was ambushed by some nobles he annoyed. They got the jump on him, but he activated a nearby warjack and fended them off. Long story short, he joined the Strategic Academy and began training as a warcaster. When finding real combat on the front lines, all of the haze of his life, his tumultuous emotions and past faded away and life made sense. He rose to captain all the time right there alongside Runewood. Runewood took multiple bullets all over his body with Anton at his side but survived. Unfortunately, as Anton had been there, he knew this was no holy action that had kept Runewood alive. It was a dark power. Runewood had fallen to the Infernals and was intentionally weakening Signal to hand it over to the Ruinous Powers. With the end of the Infernal Wars and the betrayal of his friend, he needed a break and so began his career of teaching at the Academy. The CRS. Signaran Reconnaissance Service. Maybe. Let him know that Runewood still lived. Now called the Lord of Ash. Anyway, he joined up the Storm Legion and the Orgoth invaded, so I guess we'll get back to that at another point. Which leads us, finally, to Captain Madison Calder. Unlike Athena and Anson, she was born into this life, her family being in the Signaran military the past four generations. She has personally been involved in every major battle of the past 20 years. A touch suspicious if you ask me, cause or correlation, am I right? Anyway, she is arguably the best mounted warrior in the entire army, and of course is a gifted tactician, and these three warcasters stand as the three leaders of Signar's Storm Legion. I could tell you a similar story as Anson Wolf of how she had heartbreak at a young age, and how the Kadoran Butcher of Kardov killed her family in front of her, and that set her on a path to be the best she could be, because, oh yes, what a shocker, in the heat of battle she finds peace, but totally in a good way, not in a bad way, obviously, 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 it's totally, it's totally good that these guys are killing people, it's totally fine, it's a very good thing, okay, alright, not, not in a bad way, not in an evil way, okay, good, good, good. Or I could just tell you that her horse was called Star Shadow, I'll leave it at that, no, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna go with that, I'm gonna go with the latter. Talking of the Butcher of Kardov, let's discuss Kador. Kador are the main antagonists of the setting when you want a normal external threat. They're not religious fanatics that can't be reasoned with, and they're not undead necromancers whose sole goal is literally just to kill you. For no real reason, I guess. Just fun. Fun stuff. 
This is the morally grey faction that is only the antagonist because they are a valid external threat to Signal, and their moral compass leans towards the more brutal end of the spectrum. Kador are basically fancy Russia, and that's incredibly clear when you look at their aesthetic and a lot of words they use to define their military structure. Also, they're called the Red Army. <clears throat> like, in canon, yeah, yeah. Kador had a lot of Grey Lords, spellcasters that formed an order of spellcasters and were their own faction within the Kador High Councils, with Grey Lords being found as advisors everywhere, but not really aligning with the people they were advising, right? Always massaging things towards their own goals, if you will. It turns out that their own goals were almost exclusively against the Kadoran people and almost all of them sided with the Infernals. So, Infernals defeated the, and Kador decimated, while the rest of the Iron Kingdoms enter a new period of peace and tolerance, Kador is having a bit of a mad one. Basically, Kador had lost all of its notable leaders and generals. In fairness, as a lot of factions had, because you need to kill those models so you can sell new models. Not the point, not the point, not the point. And a bunch of the great princes decide to challenge Ain Vanar, the 11th's right to lead. Ain Vanar, the 11th's right to lead. Ain Vanar gives birth to Vladimir, who is from the birth line of the great prince Shepeshi, Shepeshi of Umbre, before he was killed in the Infernal War. Bad sign for the great princes, as there's now a legitimate heir who is from both the imperial dynasty of the Empress and the weird anachronistic horse lord princes. So the princes start consolidating power instead of helping Kador, a classic one. This all happens over five years, and as Kador enters 618 AR, Ain Vanar, the Empress and Winter Queen, said, Nabra, no more. She had been raising the new Winter Core, troops loyal only to her, hiding them for a year from the High Command. In a single night, she removed every rival to her power. Now the Grey Lords didn't like this because of course they had always basically effectively ruled Kador through the power hungry princes and whisperings into ears and such. Avenar reached out to the Order of Illumination, basically the Inquisition, and set them on the, on the remaining Grey Lords. And once they were done, she disbanded the Grey Lords and made them an illegal organisation. <laughs> Smashed. With power now consolidated, the Kador War Machine's technology began making advances. Unfortunately, not nearly enough to catch up with the likes of Signar, but at least now their Man of War power armor suit didn't like burn so hot that it would regularly fuse flesh to metal when the heat of battle. They still run mandatory military service and conscription in the Winter Core. But in fairness, you like the Iron Kingdoms are literally always at war, so that like that should be like standard for every kingdom, if I'm honest. Not the point, not the point. But unlike the previous Kador military, the new regime intends to actually train their conscripts instead of using them as literal meat roadblocks to hold the enemy uh, yeah, until the elite forces arrive who actually know like which way to point a gun. At this point, Kador is the first nation to be invaded by the Orgoth because Kador has a large portion of its border being the west coast of Imran, the Orgoth land. Uh, and are basically unopposed because no one was expecting the Orgoth to return because they're literally a fairy tale at this point, you know? Now, most Warcasters, despite being spellcasters, were not in cahoots with the Grey Lords, and so many of them survived the purging and Inquisition hunt. In the Winter Corps, we have Captain Ilari Borisiuk, Ekaterina Baranova, and Commander Valerie Savarin. Let's start with Captain Ilari Borisiuk. He never knew his father and from a young age was always a solitary child. He grew into being a hunter of local wildlife, but during these hunts, he found he was magically gifted. He was born and remained a true loner, but that doesn't sound too cool, so we call him a lone wolf. Like all Kadorans, when he came of age, he entered military service and quickly was transferred to the elite Widowmaker Corps and had to reveal his gift. Upon becoming a Capitan Captain, he was gifted his custom Magelock rifle called the Shadow of Death. A Katarina Baranova was a Grey Lord, and upon their treachery, she renounced them. And after the Grey Lord hunt was finished, she returned to service thanks to the Order of Illumination, backing her up basically by writing her a glorified teacher's note and so she was granted an imperial pardon. With that in mind, she joined the new Winter Corps as one of the most powerful arcanists, not just in the army, but the whole of the Iron Kingdoms. 
Then we have Commander Valerie Saverin's, and his main thing is he's a prodigy. And it's at this point we kind of really have to note that literally every warcaster is a prodigy and incredibly gifted fighters and strategists and so I, ca I can't just say he's a prodigy and good at thinking, right? When everyone's a prodigy, no one's a prodigy. Anyway, he was a prodigy of strategy. His personal hero was Supreme Commandant Irisk. Irisk? Irisk? I don't know. Savarin completed his warcaster training uh, by 15, which for reference, Athena de Barrow didn't even start her training until 16. Savarin has only commanded during the Troubles, so purely internal bickering. But it's clear that he has his sights set on being the next Supreme Commandant. With the two largest and most well-known factions covered, nice and briefly for you, and me realising how long this video is getting and how much my throat is hurting, let's dig into the new old the new old, the new old antagonists of the setting, the Orgoth, and specifically their army of sea raiders. So as mentioned in the recent histories, the Orgoth began our recent timeline by subjugating and enslaving the entirety of Imran. They then got beat and fled, beat off, remember, they got beat off, and fled and have now returned 800 years later. But who are these mad lads? Well, they're fantasy undead Viking slavers. Yeah, smashed it, done. Law recap over. The Warcasters of the Orgoth, if they sacrifice enough souls to their infernal masters when they die, get sent back to continue their tyranny. These guys are the same level of evil as the Cricks, in fact arguably worse, because among the Cricks, it's a brutal and cutthroat life, but there are regular people that live in the Shard Isles, and yeah, they're bad people, obviously. But they generally are aware of, and to some degree share basic human concepts and morals, but unfortunately due to circumstances of their birth, are forced to be bad people. And the Lich Lords ultimately were corrupted by dragon blood at some point, which must be taken into account, I suppose. The Orgoth are not, well, they are human. And they only view other humans as a way to extend their own lives through slavery, suffering and sacrifice. They were not corrupted to be that way, that's just who they are. And as the Cricks aren't released at the time of this video, I will not be covering them again. But can you tell I'm excited for Cricks? Hell yeah. And I had to figure out a way to jam them into the video somehow, so... Cricks are better than Orgoth, smashed it. Right, Orgoth, a society based on terror and the strongest get what they want. Ruled over by a coven of war witches, the Orgoth have become a race running from their own ruin. And hey, when you're given the option for ultimate power and immortality, why wouldn't you take it? As such, the strongest among the Orgoth are slavers, yes, but have also themselves become slaves to the Felgoth Infernals, as to continue sharing their power when the Orgoth like with the Orgoth, they demand the tithe. If these most powerful Orgoth provide enough of a tithe of souls, then when they die and pass to the Abyssal Halls, the Infernals will allow them to agree to a contract. More souls and their own in exchange for power and returning to life. As all Infernals, including these Felgoth Infernals, live between Cain and ur -Cain, it's fair to say that you really don't want to die so that they can do with your soul as they wish. You, yeah, you want your soul to make it to Urkane, is what I'm saying here. Presumably it's a timeless eternity of torture because they catch your soul before it moves to the afterlife, right? With every death, with, it, with every death, these Orgoth return stronger, granted more power, and more time in the mortal realms. Minor note, all races of Cain have access to some form of magic. Deals with the various sects of Infernals, the Nocreans for the humans, and Felgoth for the Orgoth, simply enhances existing power and makes the ability to cast any magic at all more widespread. And after dying, when they return, obviously their own body is dead, so they need to return to a body of their own lineage. Unless they're performing a special ritual which extends their consciousness into the Abyssal Halls, then their physical body can be extended as well. Don't worry about it. The Felgoth Infernals, on the other hand, treat the Orgoth like thoroughbred horses uh, that they can like place bets on. They're rearing the best fighters so they can, yes, get more souls for some infernal reasons, I don't know, but also to play soul poker with their friends. The Orgoth were originally beaten off by the humans thanks to good old-fashioned human resourcefulness. Humans gained magic and technology and built colossals whilst the Orgoth grew complacent in their slaughtering to fulfil the tithe. 
Well, now the Orgoth return and have learned from what beat them, from what beat them off, have changed how they wage war, and have added new enslaved beasts to their roster. And their first strike went completely unchallenged as their sea raider armies devastated the entire coast of Cador. Most factions, upon hearing the Orgoth have returned, naturally assumed they were just a fairy tale, and the people sending these telegrams have gone nutty. Cador's navy had always been playing second fiddle to Signars, but it was still a good navy. And when they threw their entire weight behind a counterattack to try and retake the port city of Scrovenberg, it was completely routed. This gave the Orgoth total control of the entire west of Cador, which is pretty much the whole of Imran, let's be honest, because Cador's like, you get it. This action lasted only a few days before Orgoth pushed further inland and briefly took the city of Kardov, where the Orgoth warcaster and architect of this invasion, Sabreth, gained an ancient relic called the Lash. From here they became a modern man and pulled out, bringing a large portion of their seamen down south to plunge it deep into the access way of Signar, going up an inland river towards Rimmoxdale Lake. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that paragraph. Uh, my bad. That's, that's on me, that's my bad. It's staying in, obviously, but yeah, whoops. So the combined armies of what can safely be called the Alliance at this point leg it back from where they gathered to have their meeting in Cador's Kardov to help the Signar defenders. Meanwhile, the Orgoth undertook a two-pronged assault that would lead to them launching a huge attack against Signar's city of Orvan, threatening a large and important mining facility that would cripple their military production. But this was only a feint, as the real attack was sent against the dragon Blightergast, who was still recovering from his recent fight with Torok just a decade earlier in the Wormwall Mountains, where Sabreth managed to successfully channel infernal power to steal a chunk of Blightergast's Athank. Athank. Doesn't matter. So presumably, in the evolving narrative war of War Machine, we now have to deal with an Athank-infused Orgoth war witch and architect of the invasion and basically it's about to go down yeah but let's look at the war casters of the orgoths sea raiders firstly we have horusk is that right yes horusk the thousand roths in english we pronounce it roth not wrath horusk the thousand roths arguably the most powerful physical fighter in the entire Orgoth war host. His lineage, and so his power, has been through a thousand bodies before his current form, and the infernal power that infuses him is clear in his freakish stature, far beyond a normal Orgoth. When it comes to raw physical power, this is the guy. But talking about true power, we have to look at Sabreth, the Eternal Annihilation, See, she's actually a relatively new soul to the Infernals, but she has quickly made her mark and risen to be almost a leader of her people. Before taking this path of the Reaper, she helped raise the War Witches from mere advisors to the physical brutes of the Orgoth, and has made them spiritual leaders to the Orgoth. In this life, though, she's actually the architect of this second invasion. She's a matron tenebris on the path of the Reaper, which basically means she's a top member of the Warwitch Coven. But in this life, she is doing the killing thing instead of, like, the leading thing. You get it, right? Then we have Kishtar, the Howling Silence. Originally a fierce hunter in the wild wastes of the Orgoth homelands, she then found her skills t turned to better use among the blood sports and arenas of Orgoth cities. Unlike Horusk or Sabreth, Kishtar has no mind for political scheming and bickering among the powerful. She simply wants to pay the tithe and be able to return to life so she can continue her slaughter. The Eternal Dusk, House Callus, let's be clear, okay, the faction is called the Eternal Dusk, the army is called House Callus. These are the elves of the world, right? They are Iosan elves from Ios, and they are mainly all dead, kind of. The elves have their own entire history, and it's the whole thing. But we want to focus on modern elves and House Callus, so I'm not going to get sidetracked, all right? But super long story short, the elves used to be very strong with their magic, and gods walked among them, and then... The gods left, and then the humans gave up the location of the Elven Pantheon and their own souls, remember, in exchange for power from the Nanocrian Infernals. And then the Infernals maybe sort of used this information to kill the Elven gods, 
It's not like technically 100% true, but it's very suspicious timing and is true, so you know. The elves, weren't su the elves were not super chill about this, and from then on started being born without souls and becoming a much weaker race with their magic. The majority of elves closed themselves off from the rest of the world, but a splinter faction called the Retribution of Sire, Syra, yeah, became mage hunters, blaming these magic-wielding humans for destroying their race. Because these are elves and it's fantasy lore that elves' whole deal is that they're a race in decline, right? The Infernal's return made them work alongside the necromantic faction, the Scorn, to blend that necromancy with their own archantric technology. Cool, right. Okay, modern day, House Callis. One elf called Alara killed the remaining elven gods, Syra and the Lord of Winter. Cool. Killing them unleashed a psychic storm across the whole of Ios, strong enough that all attuned build beings in Cain felt it. Hype, very cool. The vast majority of elves done gone be dead now. Straight up, dead AF, as foretold. Everyone else became an eldritch. An eldritch is an elf who was alive and had a soul that died, but comes back to life, but kind of without their life essence. They're a form of undead, their bodies now withered husks instead of the lethal yet ethereal beauty that elves tend to be. The elves who were born without souls did not become eldritch, so they are still alive just without a soul. It's also hinted at pretty heavily that these eldritch are basically just vampires. There you go, I should have just called them vampires. Or at least they need living beings for sustenance. Actually, I don't know why I said hinted at, they are legitimately just vampires, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, these eldritch lords started their own houses, hence the first of the dusk is a house called House Callis. The strongest of these new houses. Oh, <clears throat> right, <clears throat> and the sundering only affected elves that were in Ios. Gotta mention that. Any elves that were beyond its borders did not go through this transformation. This was called the sundering, very different from the rivening, I assure you, obviously. To recap there, sorry, that was a bit rambly. Eldritch are the normal elves who died and came back as vampires. Soulless didn't die because they have no souls with which to receive the psychic feedback, obviously. Cool. It should be noted that the soulless in general have never been very motivated. They're kind of already just husks, right? They do have personalities and are physically capable, but without a soul they have almost no direction and are just very good at taking orders, really. House Callus is fully aware of what they are and how horrifying they are to mortals. Literally vampires again. So all these elves are now really, really bitter, but at least with House Callus, that bitterness has turned to self-hatred. Hype, great. Hashtag feel you there, lads. Kings. Not outer hatred. And so the defining way that we see the new House Callus is as one of the strongest and largest supporters of the Iron Kingdoms as they throw their all into reinforcing the humans against the Orgoth. Nice. Digging down to the Warcasters of House Callus, first and foremost, we have Helith, sire of Nightfall. Despite literally dying, Helith has not lost her memories and vividly recalls her life as a promising gun mage and warcaster for House Rysleer. Rice cake, whatever. She originally wanted to become a mage hunter for House Syra due to her empathy for the plight of her people, but with the entire landscape of her race fundamentally changed, she joined House Callis, as here she saw a way that she could be a bridge between the living and the dead. And with Orgoth invading, she sees this as the perfect opportunity to strengthen those bonds now in this time of dire need. Tyrus, Nisarsir of Spiders is a founding member of House Callus and is a devoted spellcaster. He was a follower of the necromantic general who arguably, you know, arguably ruined the country of Ios. And when he saw other like-minded eldritch lords, he joined as one of the warlords of it. Not much else is really known about uh, his current motivations, but if someone like him was a leader of House Callus, I'd be concerned. Talking of being concerned, we then have Hazaroth, Narcissar of Ruin. He's grown far larger and more physically powerful than the rest of his kin, as clearly he's fed far too greedily on the living that he fights, and fights he does. When having your throat slit doesn't kill you, it's hard to put any Eldritch down for good, and all things considered, Hazaroth is pretty content with his new life of constant fighting. 
His name, Narcissar of Ruin, is not a boast to the elves, it's a sign of how terrible they can become. He's not a good guy, they don't like him. Which brings us to the first faction that has warlocks instead of warcasters actually, a group of spellcasters who focus on channeling their raw emotions and fury for power instead of the more measured and focused warcaster spells. It's the brine blood marauders of the southern creoles. Okay. Remember when I said that Signal are the good guys, but then I said actually Signal are the protagonists and like they're the viewpoint characters of the overarching narrative, right? You recall. Well, <clears throat> Trollkin are the actual good guys. They're like Signar minus imperialism, also minus technology, and general success in life. In like, yeah. And they worship a primordial god called Dunia, not relevant, but just so you know, because in general the trolls are very into their faith. As every faction is, actually. To, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are natives of the land that get constantly displaced by the advanced nations as they need more land for industry. And in fact, the southern Creoles have been successfully displaced. Yeah. Having moved off of the continent of Imran onto the subcontinent called Alchier. Alchier? It's probably Alchier. Just to the south of the vast bloodborne desert that separates the Scorn from the Iron Kingdoms. Trolls in War Machine are very much what you'd expect. They're big, tough, hulking monsters that have regeneration abilities. That's what a troll is. If you're looking for a faction that are kind of like the orcs of Imran, then this is probably it. It's why I actually painted my 40k orcs as trollkin, um, and even included some trollkin to use alongside them in the last edition of Kilty. There are trollkin and there are dire trolls, and normal trolls, whatever. Trollkin are human levels of intelligence, but big and tough, okay? Then there are dire trolls. These are the fantasy version of Warjacks, okay? They're super big, super tough, super strong, super angry, and super dumb. As is true in real life, the bigger you are, the dumber you are. That's why I stayed a respectable height, to clarify. It was a choice, okay? These massive war beasts, unlike some of the other war beasts that you'll find enslaved to their warlocks, are generally actually pretty amenable to their smaller trollkin and will fight alongside them willingly in very unsophisticated ways, to be fair, but willingly, even without provocation. But this is War Machine, and so of course the Warlocks will be provoking them a lot, because that's you know, mechanics, right? Uh, but yes, War Beasts are like Warjacks. Dire Trolls in general are very angry and easily triggered War Beasts when approached by any other race. Even Trollkin themselves, too, sometimes. Then we have the faction name. Southern Creels. Huh? Well, a creel is a community of trolls, there you go. Or if you're Dutch, then creel actually means small potato, which also seems fitting uh, in, in, in an amusing way. The small potatoes of the world, if you will. Oh, small fry? Hmm. Anyway, but in the war machine sense, it's a tribe. A creel is a tribe. These are the southern tribes, if that makes more sense. And the first tribe, or creel, we see is the Brine Blood Marauders. They are the acting navy of the southern creels on their newly found land of Alkier. Remember when I said that Trollkin are the good guys of the setting, but they keep getting displaced, dispossessed, and disenfranchised? Yeah, well, you kind of have two reactions to this among Trollkind. Become very defensive and do your best to hold onto your lands, or become a pirate. Yeah, this seems to be a choice a lot of factions have to make, to be fair. Uh, obviously, the, the, the company called Privateer Press, they're gonna make a lot of pirates, right? Anyway, the Brian Blood Marauders went full pirate. I'm not sure if you need to know anything else, they're pirates. Pirate trolls that mainly prey on merchant vessels between Imran and the other continent, Zoo. Partly to sustain themselves, but also as violent retribution against the kings, empresses, and chartered companies that drove them from their lands. Straight up, these are a proud people pushed too far, marginalised and betrayed, and they want revenge. But with the Orgoth invading, the trade routes have slowed and now black ships prowl the waters. The Brine Bloods avoid the large Orgoth warships, so but but like if a small if, if a lone smaller vessel is sighted, they will gladly engage, and while they don't get any plunder from these engagements, because you know, Orgoth, right? They get the chance to free slaves, and as a people that have been all but enslaved, they relish the opportunity. When it comes to the warlocks of the Brine Blood Marauders, we start with their overall leader, Admiral Thorger the Thunder Boomhowler. Daughter of legendary Bragg Boomhowler and sister of famous mercenary Gregor Boomhowler. Thorga was a gifted fell caller as a child, a fell caller, sorry, 
being a trollkin that has a very powerful and booming voice that inspires and rallies those around them, as one would expect from the offspring of Bragg. After the displacement, she found herself drawn to the heavy lifting in the docks, and soon her life became an adventure novel where she tracks down like the most capable crew around, like building, you know, building her crew. Anyway, after that, like she takes these characters and they take a ship on the high seas and continue their adventures, ultimately embracing the high octane antics and thrills their lives have become, with Thorga as their captain. However, before she got to that point, the build up, if you will, her fell caller blood meant leading always came naturally to her. And after a life at sea where humans were always promoted before her and she became an alcoholic because, you know, why not? I don't know, like Molly Gray, you know. She took on a high risk job escorting vessels to far off zoo, a trade route with frequent attacks, often losing ships to the Cricks. Things went poorly. She mutinied against the human captain due to the mistreatment of the trollkin aboard and she was abandoned because the mutiny failed. Yeah. But then her trollkin rose to her defence and finally Thorga took command of her first ship, the Baying Wolf. A crew of mutineers and criminals, obviously, because they just saved her, they became pirates. As other trollkin heard that Thorga was a pirate, they rushed to join her and that's how she became more than just a ship's captain, but an admiral of a fleet called the Brineblood Marauders. We then have Captain Badlock Firequill. This guy's pirate royalty, okay? A skilled gun mage and the most infamous bandit still sailing the high seas. At first, he was the natural leader for the blind, for the brine blood marauders, as he is most certainly the most famous captain among the flotilla. However, after some time, he came to see that Thorga was indeed truly gifted at her command and came to accept that he should be her supporter, not her challenger. His exploits are known throughout Imran and Zu, and he once served under the Bandit King. And sure enough, when it comes to raw individual exploits, Firequill is your guy. Brash and impulsive, but with the skills to back it up, he will never back down from a challenge and always be quick to offer a solution through pistols at dawn. Captain Shadow Tongue captains the Tenebrous and uses his mighty arcanist powers to be where he needs to be when he needs to be there. Always managing to help the Brineblood Armada just when they need it the most. When not saving their Trollkin Bacon, he sticks to looting the coastline of the Iron Kingdoms and is much loved by his crew because he personally doesn't take any of their loot. Because what would someone like him do with such earthly materials? He is a solitary character with no friends, and even his ship seems to be a soulless place, with all of his crew seeming little more than shells at times. In years gone past, he was actually enslaved by the Cricks, pressed into their service in the Shard Isles when captured by Ogren slavers. Although he lost friends and family, the Crixians know arcane value when they see it, and so they traded Shadow Tongue to a necromancer, and then fully worked aboard the Crixian slaughter ships he had to. If we knew his full background, I suspect we wouldn't be so quick to invite him into the Brine Blood Marauders, and maybe it's for the best that he keeps himself at a distance, if we're being honest. Then we get into the final faction that has released to date, which is the Chimera, with their first army, the Shadow Flame Shard. Remember how I began this video talking about how the dragons are pretty important and are basically gods, and they have a thanks which just like means their heart and that's important too, yeah, okay. Picking up where we left off. Okay, so, here we have the Chimera, obviously a play on the word Chimera, because it's the same word, just spelt differently, which is a beast from Greek mythology, with its whole shtick being two things fused together. That's this faction. It's mini dragons fused with robots. How? Dragons. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so, right, okay. One of Torok's brood was Everblight. One of the weakest dragons in the brood, but extra cunning. Did some stuff, had its own faction up until the Infernals. Two champions of this dragon, Everblight, were sisters Sarin and Rias. These were two Nis warcasters, Nis basically just being Frost Elves, okay, for simplicity's sake. Some stuff went down, and long story short, one of the sisters sacrificed themselves to save the other, but managed to trap their own soul and consciousness inside part of Everblight's Aethank 
and get it to her sister who then fused with it. Cool, classic stuff, right? Great. So now the two sisters essentially share a body. Everblight, whose whole thing is being a tricksy, cunning, devious dragon, is pretty annoyed that he got tricked by his champions because, if not clear, he did not give them part of his Aethank willingly. During the escape of the still living sister, she realised she wasn't going to survive if it was just her, so she needed an army. As she was fleeing, she ended up in some grand underground workshops of the Cephalix, a group of humans who are closely aligned with Crix due to them all being super into horrifying like body mutations and grotesque experimentation. Why? Pass. That's for another time. Uh, my voice is about to give out, honestly. I need a drink. I need to refresh. I need to revitalize. I need to hydrate. But uh, let's, let's power through, okay? We're almost there. So, with the sisters being all about the dragonlings, worms, and wivens, wyverns? No, don't be dumb. Wivens, and vaguely snake-like abominations of Everblight, and running into a Cephalix workshop, they got to work and augmented the various races that they had until recently been fighting alongside. How did they know how to do this? Visions from the god Cyrus. Smashed it, nice. Problem, question answered. This gives us the Chimera, a race of robot ninja worms. Oh, you know what? They're literally the mutant ninja turtles. Ah oh, man, I should have done that as my color scheme. Bulls. Never mind. Okay. Well, you know, next time. You can, t you can have that one. You can do that. Right, we have two Warcasters, and the first one is called Rassic, Spawn of Shadows, and I'll get it out of the way quickly because his only drip of lore at this point is that he's devoted to his second Warcaster, uh, like, who has a bit of a cr a actual lore, okay? Right. Shyris, the Flawless Dark. Shyris, like all of the Chimera, are born pretty much fully formed, and so she picked her own name, meaning Dark Cloud in the Nis language. She's a purpose-built warcaster, of course, but among the warcasters, her role began as a scout. To find fresh resources for the growing army, to move beyond the, its subterranean depths, and naturally prefers life above ground and away from the busy hive of her birth, which is weird for the Chimera. Her style of warfare is the deadly rogue, tracking and stalking her prey for as long as is needed until she truly understands them. However, her first big assignment, which we don't as yet know, has given her a third role, the Emissary. Her nature of stalking and understanding seem to have given her a better ability to understand those around her, in fact. Now, the big question is, who will, will she be an Emissary to and from? Well, from we know, but to. We don't really know if the Chimera are really good or bad, or what their goals are as a faction. I mean, yes, Legion of Everblight were bad, because, you know, dragons bad. Or at least no dragons yet good, shall we say. But Saren and Rias were possibly forced into it. No, they weren't. They betrayed Everblight, and you know, enemy of my enemy is my friend, but they betrayed Everblight the way a Sith apprentice betrays their master, you know? They did it to gain more powerful, to become more powerful and become more evil, right? But dragons don't like Torok, so Shyris, like, won't be an emissary to Crix, so it's just the Orgoth? Giving the Orgoth an ally right in the Wormwall Mountains? I, 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 don't know. I don't know. We will find out in the next novella, no doubt. And that's War Machine Law. As this was so long, I tried my best to get to the point and not interject too much rambling and personal opinion. But I think, for me, one of the things I really enjoy is the overall fantasy setting with magic and fantasy kingdoms and elves, etc. But brought up to a more relatable technology, I love elves. Elves with guns. Yes that allows for a less of a suspension of disbelief. And that means that if I'm feeling like a traditional fantasy story, I can pay attention to the knights. If I want an evil story, I can look at Crix and Orgoth. If I want a World War One or Two story, I've got Trenchers and Kador. Or again, Signal and Kador. If I want a much more modern take on a classic special optive squad, Band of Brothers, superheroes, or spy novel. Oh, or pirates, right? Look, I'm not really into the pirate thing. If I'm honest, that's like, you know, not my vibe. Uh, which is pretty awkward considering you know, privateer press. Private, yeah, mm, yeah. Anyway, I hope this has helped you understand the basics of War Machine Law in 2024. It's been a super long script for me, so please consider liking and leaving a comment. And if you really enjoyed it, checking out my Patreon. Uh, and you know, if you if you know other people into War Machine, spread this around. Hopefully, a little bit of a lore primer is going to help. Stay polite, stay humble, and hydrated. Goodbye. <laughs>